So I think it was back in August when Beth approached Ray and I about coming to the library tonight and doing this event. And we were both very excited about it and the program was going to be very different because Ray was gonna be here with us. But as many of you know, after a long life, Ray died on December 23rd. But he and I had been talking about this program probably starting November 17th, because November 16th was the last night that he did a nightlife at the academy. And the way that Ray and I worked was, he always wanted to have an event planned that he was thinking about. So I had to be careful not to tell him a date too early because then he would lose sleep at night because he'd be planning the table and where he would put things and writing the cards and everything. So I waited until November 17th after we finished the November 16th thing and told him about January 31st that this was the date. So we talked about it a lot and I wrote down all the specimens that he wanted me and he wanted us to bring that night and actually the day before he died, the last thing he told me was to bring the spider monkey skull, which is on the little table in the front, because um, it's the one near the seats, near the chairs, because he wanted you all to see the difference between a nocturnal monkey and a, and a daytime monkey. So those are here because I was told to make sure I brought them here. <laughs> so. It's probably not the way he would have set up the skulls. They probably would have been in a different order, but I did the best that I can. And it's all Ray's labels for all the skulls. So I first met Ray in 2002 when I became a curatorial assistant at the California Academy of Sciences. And my first day of work was packing skulls in his house for the skulls exhibit, which I did not know was going to be part of my job. So here, we're here tonight mostly to see the film, and, and the, the film is now here at the library, so people can borrow the uh, Life with Skulls. Beth Cataldo will talk to us later, um, but you can now borrow it from the library. So that was the impetus of this whole event, was that the, the library now has the, the movie here. But here's a picture of Ray that Beth took in his museum. So Ray became a field associate with the California Academy of Sciences in 1953 and remains so. I think his last field collection was in 2013. Um, he collected more than 6,000 skulls, probably close to 7,000. 6,100 of them have catalog numbers. He collected all of those under the Cal Academy permits, but really Ray was an extra, extraordinary volunteer. He covered the area from Año Nuevo to Bodega Bay. He would get phone calls at his house. Everybody knew his phone number. All the Beach Watch people probably had it memorized. Some of you probably still do. Um, and all the lifeguards knew his number too. So we didn't have a hotline at the time. Ray's phone was the hotline. And he would go out to any dead marine mammal that he got reports of. Now, he had started this in 1953. The Marine Mammal Protection Act came into effect in the 1970s, and the Marine Mammal Stranding Network was formed as well. So as permitting became part of the procedure, Ray was collecting under all Cal Academy permits. So not only did he go out to the beaches and collect skulls and data, the really important part was the data, where the animal was, when it was there, how big it was, if it was a male or female. But he also prepared all the skulls at his house, so, or some of them in the lab at the academy. I, I often tell tours when we go to our stinky lab in the museum, the old lab used to be up on top of the roof. And Ray would come over after school and clean skulls and work. These are some of the pictures of him when he was teaching. And we'd get calls from downstairs, the main exhibit floor, because he'd be dumping these stinky buckets and the air intake valve for the entire museum was right outside the door. <laughs> and they'd say, Ray, Ray, stop what you're doing. We're having a wedding down here <laughs> or something. 
So he would spend many, many late nights cleaning skulls either at his house or in the museum laboratory. I'm going to show you a few of his favorites. So this was a Baird's beaked whale. We only have three or four of them in the collection. This was the third one that we collected. And Ray basically single-handedly removed the skull from that animal on Ocean Beach. And then you can see in the picture a year later when it was cleaned after being buried, he was always showing it off whenever he came into the museum collection. This sperm whale was the first whale that I ever worked on with Ray and was one of his last big whale adventures. It was a, a difficult place to get to, <clears throat> so he only went to it once. But um, it had 400 pounds of net in its stomach, and if you go to the Marine Mammal Center, they have a sculpture made from that net. So that was a, that was a very exciting one, and he worked very hard along with Carrie Sorensen, another volunteer, to take all the teeth out of that animal for the museum. This was the last whale, I think. <laughs> Phalene's favorite picture. This is a pelvic bone of a whale, which Ray always said was the hardest bone to find in a whale's body, but is actually the easiest bone to collect because when you're working on a large whale, it's the smallest thing and the easiest thing to get off of the beach. So we actually have the pelvic bone of this blue whale from being hollow, the one he's holding in his hand all dirty and messy from just coming out of the whale. It's here in the front. And it's next to a humpback whale pelvic bone. So since Ray taught me how to find pelvic bones, we collect pelvic bones from every whale that we work on these days. So Ray loved doing events. He would have loved to have been here tonight. He would love the question and answer section. He would have loved answering all your questions as you look at the skulls. He particularly liked the Halloween event, Supernatural. He often would have four tables set up and tons of kids and, and parents all would come to that event. And he always insisted on wearing this Eland mask, which freaked me out, but he all, the kids loved it for some reason. But. But he would also do, every other month, we would do a nightlife event together, members' nights, special events for openings of exhibits and things. But Ray's real accomplishment was the Skulls exhibit. And he single-handedly curated the first Skulls exhibit in 2003. Earlier today, I found a big piece of paper where he had drawn out every single case and what he wanted in each case. Um, it was amazing, and that was when I first started, I didn't understand the breadth of this exhibit, but he wrote every label and decided every specimen, and there were over 1,800 specimens in that exhibit. It was redone in 2014. He helped with it, but by then we had a, a different exhibits team, and they did all the designing. This is the sea lion wall from the original, and the current one is now up in the museum. He also loved to give tours, which Jacob is continuing that tradition. Um, he would give tours of the museum whenever he could, whenever people asked, or when people wanted to do interviews. And then the, the museum was always available to researchers. So the reason he collected all these skulls was for scientific research, for the research collection. So sometimes researchers came to the academy collection and then went over to his house to see the rest of the specimens. And now that he's no longer with us, his collection will move to the academy and will be there. So although tours won't be available at the house anymore, um, they will, the specimens will be at the collection. So they'll join over 32,000 specimens that are in the mammal collection that will be available to researchers from around the world. And there will be over 6,500 marine mammals, one of the largest marine mammal collections in the world. And because of Ray's collection, we have the largest collection of California sea lions of any museum anywhere in the world. There are the sea lions. We also have the largest southern sea otter collection and the largest Guadalupe fur seal collection, mostly because of the work that Ray did. So you can continue to visit the sea lion wall, which hangs above the project lab at the museum. That will be there indefinitely. And on May 24th, 
the Academy, along with Ray's family, we're going to have a special Bones nightlife. The, whole, the theme for the entire night will be Bones. We'll set up as many of Ray's displays as we can. And now I think it's time to let you see the movie. So what motivated me was his ability to tell stories about the natural world. And, uh, <laughs> and, <me. laughs> and uh, then we'll see it one more time. Uh, and I'd never seen anyone like this before, and I, I wasn't really into science, as unlike Mo. I mean, I, I just came, I was much more into technology. And when I went to this backstage tour, and Ray told us about those skulls, it really opened my eyes to another way to live in the world. It was really interesting. So I wanted to make a movie about him, but I had no idea what it would be. And then um, I met all these other people, and they told these stories about Ray. But in the end, my goal of this movie was to really showcase someone who has lived his life in a very creative way, but a very positive way that added to science. Because I think we don't get enough media that talks about people like this. But I know there are so many, there's a lot of Beach Watch volunteers here tonight, and you people are, are very similar. They give back to the world and live in this very generous way and um, call them citizen scientists. I think Ray is a really um, proud citizen science. Um, and so I really wanted to celebrate that. And, uh, and so I, I think it does. It really celebrates who he was. He, as his wife said at the end, I think that's my favorite quote in the movie. They were very free people. They lived very exciting lives, but they added to the positive. So that's kind of my goal in, in making this movie about Ray. Anyhow, was there a question? I think I saw a hand over there. And we'll wait for the mic. OK, this man in the front row, yeah. Hello, uh, my name is Tony Colonies. I was one of the managers of the zoo. It's not so much a question as a, a remembrance. I started at the zoo in 1971, and there was this fellow who would appear over by, uh, we didn't even have an animal hospital then. He'd appear over by the freezer. And, oh, I, I got the word, that, that's Ray. He's the skull guy from the academy. I thought he worked at the academy all, the, all that time, so that's news to me even now. But. Uh, Doc Mottram would call Ray up in the middle of the night and say we're, we lost something. If the keepers would get there at 7.30 in the morning. We'd see Ray over by the, over by the freezer. They'd come over and say, Ray, what died? <laughs> <laughs> he, knew about, if, he knew about it before we did. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, the zoo animals added a lot of depth to Ray's collection, and they will to the Academy collection as well. And there was a specific researcher She's still around. She works on um, primates. And I know that she and Ray had several situations where one time she got out there and she said, Ray, this one's mine. You're not getting it. <laughs> but she had to take it with the arrangement that it would eventually come up to Ray after she was done with her muscle research. <laughs> okay. Um, first, I just want to thank you for making that great film. I really, really loved it. Um, Ray was kind of an obsessive person, as Doug Long sort of said to the side there. And I know, have known some other collections managers who also have a kind of obsessive quality. And I, I love the way they've kind of converted this desire to keep collecting, to keep going, 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 and turned it into something really beautiful and helpful and, and, and positive. And uh, I am wondering if there's anybody here who knows exactly how Ray found that, that, that trick. That is, you know, when um, collecting skulls as a compulsion became collecting skulls as a contribution. Well, I think he probably knew that from the beginning, because when he was in high school, he would bring specimens to the Steinhardt Aquarium to have them, not marine mammals, but you know, different reptiles and amphibians that he found and insects and things. So he always understood the value of collecting the specimen, but also collecting the data with the specimen. So that first animal in 1953, the first harbor seal, we know it's the, he wrote on the skull. It's, you know, the data is all there. Mm -hmm. And it's actually number 53 or 54, 53 in his collection, which means that before that, he had brought other things and kept the data. So I think it came with his love of science, even from a very young age. 
And he did grow up near the Academy of Sciences. Whether that made a difference, I don't know if his family has any insight into that. But, uh, you know, I think, again, what you're near, I think, speaks to you. So maybe that just pulled him in from an early age. But he did always collect creepy crawlies, as he would say. That's where he started. And I don't know if he had any mentors or anything. He never mentioned any names yeah. to me. No, he was self-taught. He was self-taught. Yeah. Yes, he was a mentor to many of us. Yeah. That is true. Any other questions? Uh, for those of us who can uh, stomach the the craft, um, are there is there any plans in the works for like a like a skull and blown club kind of? Uh, for volunteers to learn and carry on some of that? So we do, at the Academy, we do have a, a number of volunteers that come in and work for us, and I, you know, ask people to apply through our volunteer services. We do require people to start cleaning disgusting skulls, because that's a really good way to to know if a volunteer is going to stick around for very long. <laughs> if they can clean skulls in the stinky lab, then they're, they done. win. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, I encourage you to apply. A question, couple of questions here. Oh, thank you. Good to see you again, Mo. Um, Chris Journey here from Tree Frog, and I wanted to say two things. One was a, a comment, and one was a question. So years ago, when I first met Ray, was down at the academy, at sort of the beer on the non balcony in the herpetology room, in the in the depths and the annals of the old academy. When I was a young young guy, like probably a teenager. And um, I was working on a few things, having fun. And so then he was really inviting and inclusive about all sorts of things that we could do together. And I was just, you know, this like this little flea on the whale of the academy. And that never changed. He was as inclusive and open and welcoming and warm to everybody he ever met, which I think is um, hugely important to, to shine a positive light on uh, just anybody can do science. Science is everywhere. This, this, it doesn't matter if you're smart or new or naive. Just check it out. So fast forward to 2003, when that Baird's Beak whale went, uh, went on the shore, I was uh, courting a young woman who became my wife. We were walking on the beach at sunset, and Ray shot up to me. He recognized me. He goes, Chris, there's a Baird's Beak whale on the beach. We've got to take its head off. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this... This is before he even really introduced himself to my girlfriend, Nicole. And she knew Ray from just me being around the academy, working there and stuff like that. So she said, give me a ride home. I'll see you later. So I gave her a ride home. I lived on 4th and Irving, came back down. And of course, once again, he was just like, yeah, this is a really great opportunity. He told me the whole story. At midnight, we got busted by the National Park Service police, so to speak. And as you said, these crazy calls. So I'm this guy. The, the, the guy doesn't want to hear anything. ID. I said, OK. And I gave him my license and Ray gave him his license and showed him the uh, Cal Academy badge but didn't stop cutting the whole time when the guy is talking <laughs> to him and he's like come back tomorrow gentlemen so I left and then of course uh, Douglas Long came down and for days and days we worked on this thing and sadly not sadly but it's funny like he broke the um, zygomatic arch you know of that elephant well the same thing happened kind of the bear's beak a little bit they needed to get it off the beach because Stupid things were happening, like gangs were tagging, et cetera. And they pulled it, and every single person in the world came out to help Ray. The lifeguards, the volunteers that were everywhere, they you know, deflated tires, and a troop of cars came out onto the sands. It, they could have been stranded there. And, and they finally got that thing off, and they buried it and redid it. So the, the comment was that he was really you know, inclusive. And the question is, how can we keep that kind of positivity around in this day and age of, you know, mm -hmm. quick and dirty communication, not, not real FaceTime. You talk about FaceTime. Of course, he wore that jacket for 35 years. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I don't even know. We, we, he had like seven nicknames beyond bones. Let's put yeah. it that way, yeah. based on the smell of that jacket. And it was all good. <laughs> so that's my question. And yeah. I want to salute everybody here for supporting Ray. Thank yeah. you. I mean, there's one thing, uh, Kelly is doing this uh, program tonight, and I think there are a lot of opportunities to do citizen science in the Bay Area. Um, and I know there's a lot of beach watchers here tonight. How many beach watch people are here? So beach watch, for example, is a program where we're trained and then we go out every uh, month to um, survey beaches and collect data about live and dead things. And there's a relationship among those people, um, but it's not as... Um, maybe vibrant as working with Ray, but 
I think there's a lot of organizations, um, and I know Kelly's trying to get these bio blitzes out from the library with people working in community to actually go out together and enjoy nature, but add to science. So I do think technology has helped us um, on the way to work as groups, but um, we have to search it out. We really do have to search it out rather than staying in front of our computers, yeah. I also think one of the things Ray instilled in myself and some of the people who work with me and w is whenever we're out on the beach, this, we do the same thing that he used to do. We always stop and interact with the public and answer their questions. And sometimes we get peed on by dogs, but we still, <laughs> we still stop. And people yeah. always have questions, and they're so curious about what's going on. And the more information we can get out there, the better. Andy, did you have a question? No, yeah. Since I'd never heard of him or this before, uh, I was wondering, I mean, if he, and I will try and see the house before, you know, it all goes to the academy, but if it all goes to the academy, uh, why hasn't it already gone earlier? Why has it always <laughs> been in his house? If it is so important to science and to you, um, why, when this academy was rebuilt, didn't you create space and maybe even a lab again for him to do that? Or maybe you have one meanwhile and, you know, he still loved doing it at home, but could you explain that? All of the above. So in the new academy, we did um, include the amount of space that Ray's collection would take when we designed the, the collection storage area. So hopefully we will have enough room for all of it. And believe me, over the years, I have tried to get some of it to come over. You know, it's more than 6,000 skulls that we're yeah. looking at moving now. Um, but he always, he loved his museum. And he loved being able to sit in the museum and look at everything and just be surrounded by the bones. So we never pressured him. And researchers were always welcome. And I would make arrangements and... You have to warn them a little bit, you know, about the house, and it's so full of stuff, and it's, there's not a lot of room for work, but he was always open to them coming up there. So they were still available to scientists. They were just in an off-site storage location that... I would have liked to have had them integrated into the collection when we moved back to the new building in 2008, but that's okay. <laughs> They'll come now. And we do have a lab in the new building that uh, smells just as bad as the old lab did. <laughs> and Ray worked in that lab as well. Wow. Okay. Mo, Mo, I did ask, want to ask you a real question, which is um, with the trends in uh, education and so many of the old zoology departments are, and the mm. commitment to natural, to, to natural uh, science studies, field studies, and so on, being moved into integrative biology or whatever. Uh, what is it, and your collection is, that you curate is so remarkable. What, what do you think is the fate of all these very large collections in the modern, modern world? Well, I think one of the things that's happening with collections is people are developing new tools to study collections. So, for example, just a couple of weeks ago, I sent off a large piece of adult male blue whale baleen that was collected in 1979 to a researcher who's studying hormones in, in whales, large whales. And what they can look at is look at the hormones and the stress hormones, and they can see where the whales suffered stress and where they were geographically when that happened. So technology has allowed scientists to ask more in-depth questions. You can look back at specimens and compare the environmental conditions that they lived in using technology, stable isotopes, from the past to current day, and that can tell you a little bit about climate change, and it can give you more information on the influences of the environment on those animals. So even though not as many people are doing morphology studies, the traditional studies with museum specimens. There are so many new technologies that are coming out with CT scans and stable isotopes and hormones and aging things with growth layers and teeth and baleen that I think there will always be a use for it. 
And it's important to continue to build those collections so that 100 years from now, people can look back at our time period and study the stable isotopes in the animals from now compared to the ones 100 years ago, compared to the ones 100 years from now, and be able to tell some stories and understand the environment. Thanks for putting this film together. It was fantastic. Mm -hmm. this whole event. Mm -hmm. So um, I have one brief <clears throat> excuse me, question and then uh, a second one to follow up. Um, one, the brief one is, I, I see a couple of folks wearing the necklaces. Mm -hmm. Is there some, and he was as well in the movie, is there some significance to the actual bone? Are they special in any way? He had about six different bone ties. This one has a number on it, which means it's cataloged, and it's an elk vertebrae. Oh. I'm not sure which one Jacob has, tiger vertebrae. He almost always wore the hyena, which I couldn't actually find today. But Ray, whenever he went out to an event, he wore his fancy pants and his fancy striped shirt, and he had a, a carved comb in his upper pocket, and he always wore a bone tie. So for tonight, we thought we'd wear some bone ties. So these are from his collection? From the collection, yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah Jacob's his nephew. Yeah. Oh, a great nephew. Excellent. Yeah. Good to see family here. Okay, one more. Um, I'm sorry, I just had one yeah. quick other question. I just want to make sure I'm interpreting something correctly. During the movie, he was talking uh, something about a license or something. Do you, did he have to have a? Did, do you or anyone have to have a special license license to do this sort of? So thing? marine mammals, endangered species, and birds are all protected species. So in order to have parts, any parts, even if you just find something somewhere, you can't prove that you didn't kill, have something to do with killing that animal. So we are part of the Marine Mammal Stranding Network, which gives us authorization from the National Marine Fisheries Service to respond to any dead marine mammal. And then we have all the US Fish and Wildlife Service permits for migratory birds. So Ray, as a field associate with us, was covered under all of those permits. Okay, thank you. Yep. So over here. Uh, well done on the film, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering um, what additional information might um, be within the rest of the skeletal remains. Uh, the film talked about the significance of the skull, mm -hmm. but if there's other data um, in the rest of the skeleton, if there's any effort by the academy others to collect um, those bones as well. In some cases, we do collect larger skeletons. So, for example, over the past couple of years, there have been uh, there's been a die off of Guadalupe fur seals, the endangered species that um, we actually have the female here with the jaw that he was talking about had the really old female with all of her teeth missing. Um, so we will make choices about collecting entire skeletons based on the value of that specimen. So because we had so few of that species to begin with, we would keep the entire skeleton, uh, two from every county that washed up. This was in the past two years. But in general, we do stick to collecting the skulls because, in, as Ray said, it's the easiest thing to get off the beach. Um, if it's a large animal, like we an orca, we collected an entire orca in 2011, which took five really difficult trips to the beach, and a lot of 37 people helped me get that whole orca off the beach. So we just make the choice with resources and the value, but really most of the value is in the skull with the teeth and the brain case, and you can learn a lot from the skulls. And I think one thing maybe that was not spelled out is that um, like when Mo or someone else goes out on the beach, they try to do a necropsy on the dead animal to see how it died. Um, so they'll examine it for any other information that they can get from it on the beach. So a lot of times they will know how it died when they leave it. And it, like one time, Sue Pemberton is the one who goes out there now and she's like, Beth, did you know that was a shark bite? I'm like, no, I'm glad you went out, Sue. So they can tell a lot of times how an animal has died, and they'll take that data on the beach. Thank you, thank you, Beth. It's a wonderful film. Um, the early one of the early specimens that had the even teeth. You know, all, mm -hmm. do we have any idea why that was the case? Mo can tell. Yeah. So one of the things that we've learned recently 
is in, in a lot of cases, if animals are eating sharks, their teeth will wear down consistently across the board. So there's a bottlenose dolphin here who also had its teeth worn down to the gum line. And that orca that I just mentioned was a young animal because it was known from life with its teeth worn down to the gum line. Sharks have skin that has what's called dermal denticles. So it's like sandpaper. So as they bite on the, the shark skin, it wears down their teeth over time. That's the theory. We know it's true with orcas. We don't always know that it's true with other animals. But dolphins don't chew. So they, this wear is probably from dermal denticles. From skin. This is probably a stupid question, but whenever I see a sea lion, its nose is always physically the highest point. Uh, uh, on its body? On, and if I did that, I'd have a stiff neck. And I, I'm wondering, <laughs> I mean, is there any, can you say Gosh, anything There probably that? is a physiological reason for that that I don't know, because yeah. I deal with mostly dead animals. <laughs> <laughs> but there's marine mammal people here, so maybe Anyone could, know? Yeah. Go up to the Marine Mammal Center and ask them. They'll know. Does anyone know the answer to that? I think it's because they, they can raise their head the least amount and still extract air. Because they can raise their head the least amount and still extract air. So no energy is given off. Yeah. Hi, I'm, I'm Mike. I'm actually a cousin of Ray's. Oh. Uh, my mom was his first cousin, so I can't add any of the scientific end, but I can give you a little flavor on the family side. Um, <laughs> As a young child, I never went to that Ray's house because I was afraid, because not only afraid of the skulls, but he also had some live reptiles at his house, not legal, and um, that was they were poisonous, and so that as a kid was a little scary to think about going there. Um, and as lovely as he is, he was known as being a little bit eccentric in our family. Um, <laughs> I've never worn a bone tie myself, but uh, at our wedding, he, of course, had his bone tie and was very proud of that, would always be very proud of, of his dress. Um, and I, another time, I think there was a party because he always, as you said, had the striped blue shirt and the big comb in his pocket, which was actually in your movie yeah. quite a few times. His comb sticks out. And he was, there was a surprise party. It was his 60th, his 60th birthday party. And they told him he was going to someone else's party. And he got there and everyone had those shirts on and the, and the combs in his pocket. And he was just, I think it was too much for him. He kind of, you know, too much uh, shirt. But, you know, obviously he was a lovely man. And, and we enjoyed having him as part of our family. I've always been very proud that I can talk about his house and, and such. Um, one last thing, as, as a small child, that they had, he had a number of cousins. My my mother was there was ten brothers and sisters above them, so there was a, a number of children, and they used to go away in the summer all together to Los Gatos, which was then you know kind of the country. And Ray talked about it that he used to, as a small child, go and collect reptiles, you know, in the going along the the creek and and just collecting things, which I'm sure my mother and other cousins were thrilled to have him come back with at mm -hmm. the end of his yeah. outing. So I think he was always from day one like that. Yeah. Okay. Any other? Hey. Oh, we have another question. Um, I, I didn't know Ray, so I'm not familiar with the family, but um, is his um, lovely wife still with us? She is, yeah. yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Good. Oh, great. Yeah. She's at home tonight. She's uh, 90 years old? How old is 88. Ella? 88. Yeah, I, will be... Um, 89 in July. She'll be 89 in July. Yep. She could make it tonight. Okay. Anything else? We got a, another one here? Don't be shy. <laughs> you mentioned that uh, the whale skull was one of his favorites, but I'm just curious, like, what were his favorite animals, favorite skull that really, like, got him going? Well, you know what? Um, it's funny. I just was... Uh, writing a book with Ray and took a bunch of photos of his favorite skulls and was working with him. And he passed away the day after I kind of gave him the first draft. So I finished the book um, and I'll have copies for sale if anyone wants it in the back later. And that has most of his favorite skulls. Um, but I think this Guadalupe Furcio was one of his, is she over there? Yeah. And she's in the movie. Her, um, her, uh, uh, he was just fascinated by this old female who had climbed up on the beach and her, you know, her state of 
of um, kind of life and death was in this skull. And I think he really found that skull one of his, the most fascinating ones. And he had a couple ones that had like teeth in them. He had one, I think, bear that had a, uh, was it a mountain lion tooth stuck in its head, but it didn't get killed by the mountain lion. It was actually shot by a hunter. And that one he found fascinating. I don't know, so you know. Well, whenever you would ask him what his favorite skull was, he, could never, he would never answer that question. So really pulling these images out in these individual specimens was, the Bairds was maybe not his favorite, but he talked about it a lot. And whenever we did events, he'd always want the Baird speak whale to come out if it could, along with, you know, the narwhal and the, the cancer deer and all. He had a whole list of things, but it was really hard for him to name a favorite. There's no one favorite that he had. I think he really appreciated them all for the art and for the science that they mm -hmm. were. He did tell me a week before he died that he wanted to bring some bones from the living room. I'm just remembering this now, and I'm very sorry that I didn't bring them tonight because mm -hmm. he said, I want to bring like the... It was someone's femur, one of the femurs from the living room of the house or the pelvic bone of the elephant or something because he wanted to talk to you all about how these bones not only represented science but were really pieces of art. Mm -hmm. And he said, I want to get up there and I want to, do you think there'll be time for me to get up and talk about the art involved? And I forgot about that, so I'm sorry. I remembered the nocturnal monkey, but I forgot about the bone from... Maybe the elephant's pelvis, yes. So you can just imagine it was between Alchemini and Ray, the art was really a big mm -hmm. part of it as well, and the sculpture of the, the bones. Yeah. Just right. agree. Okay. Thank, thank you thank all you. for coming. Yeah, thank you.